Thank you. That was a very nice introduction. Thank you very much. It makes me feel like I should talk about sleep and feeding, but um, uh, this morning, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to talk about our new teaching center here at Williams. And um, first off, I'd like, love to say welcome back. I, I don't know how long it's been since you've been here, but um, I know uh, coming back to your institution is always a really uh, heartfelt, wonderful thing. And I, I can't imagine a better weekend to be here too. I know the, the, it's so beautiful right now, and it's just a, it's definitely a mountain day worthy uh, uh, weekend, um, the, the colors, and the, and it's supposed to be really nice uh, this whole weekend, so nice job picking a weekend. Um, it's also very good. Um, but it, yeah, it's my pleasure today to, to talk about our new uh, teaching center here at Williams. Um, our new uh, center for teaching is two years old now, and um, I am a huge cheerleader for the center for teaching. Um, I, I was really excited about the fact that Williams was uh, planning one for the last several years, and now I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And so what I wanted to do this morning was just take some time to tell you what it is, uh, what, what the goals are, uh, why I think it's of benefit to, to Williams and the, the Williams faculty. And um, I'd be happy to talk um, and, and answer any questions you have, both about the teaching center, but even just more broadly teaching at Williams and some of the issues that are coming up in the classroom now here, here at Williams. And um, um, yeah, it's, it's my, my pleasure to be here. So thank you for, for, for joining us. So. Our, our teaching center is officially called the Joseph Lee Rice III 1954 Center for Teaching. Um, it was endowed by um, uh, Joseph Lee Rice and his wife, Francie Blasberg, um, who have given a lot to Williams over the years. Um, they uh, donated uh, part of a faculty lounge at, at Hollander, and they've endowed the teaching center um, in, in perpetuity. Um, but here, just in informal conversation, we simply refer to it as the Rice Center for, for Teaching. And um, the, the goal of the Rice Center for Teaching is actually very simple and very clear. It's, it's to do anything that helps faculty develop their craft of teaching and celebrate their craft of teaching. And Williams obviously already, you all know this, um, has wonderful teachers. The, the, you know, it, 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 Williams faculty are uh, dedicated, very, very thoughtful. They're, they're already really great teachers. And so why does Williams need a, a center for teaching? Um, the idea for the center for teaching was uh, in, in some part to help faculty connect with each other and to learn what we're doing in, in each other's classrooms. I, uh, Williams faculty are very dedicated and, and very great at their craft, but in some ways we're a little bit siloed in our own departments and in, in, in our own classrooms. And any time there was an opportunity for faculty to talk with each other and, and find out a little bit more about what we do, I would always see a great excitement in, in faculty's faces. And I myself loved sitting in on other faculty classes and having conversations with faculty. And so during the strategic planning process that happened um, about five years ago when uh, President Maude Mandel arrived, um, there was a, a real need articulated for, for sharing what, what faculty are doing in the classroom. And I can even read from the strategic planning report that there was a desire for a center to serve as a hub for resources, resources and services and a space where faculty could reflect on their own teaching practices, learn about new strategies and approaches, and benefit from peer mentors and conversation partners. And um, additionally, uh, they, faculty expressed the desire to have a place that allows faculty to realize their fullest potential as teachers and mentors. And so that's how I see the Center for Teaching, is, is a place that faculty can come together to share ideas, to learn new ideas, to find out about practices that are being developed in higher education, to learn about uh, maybe a new piece of technology, a new strategy, uh, dealing with current events and current issues. Um, and um, and I think over the past two years, it's been really great to see the hunger that faculty had for such a such a hub uh, come come in, into practice. Um, the values that the, the center has, I, I think these are very important, is that uh, the, the Rice Center for Teaching serves all faculty from the moment they arrive, new, newer faculty, visiting faculty, all the way up um, through more senior faculty at all career stages, all divisions, all units, including athletics. We've tried really hard to uh, involve every division of the college, including athletic faculty. Um, the Teaching Center appreciates a wide range of teaching practices and philosophies. Um, it supports inclusive and accessible teaching practices that serve all of our students. Uh, it focuses on all aspects of teaching, both formal and informal. Um, it facilitates learning and growth inside and outside the classroom, and uh, it responds to the changing needs and interests of the faculty over time. And then finally, this is my favorite 
favorite value of, of the teaching center is that the, the, the teaching center recognizes that science is both a science in which there are, are evidence-based practices to inform what good teaching looks like and how students learn, but it's also an art in which teaching um, is something that uh, is an expression of, of uh, the different faculty. Um, it, it's an expression of our skills, our values, our passions, and so by combi combining the science and the art of, of teaching, um, the Rice Center really just uh, promotes the development of faculty realizing their fullest potential um, in, in the classroom. So this is what the Rice Center was all about in, in sort of a broad view, is, is just really um, helping faculty share with each other what they're doing and adding some new ideas in, into the mix. Um, right now there's six people involved with the, the teaching center, so I'm very um, excited to uh, be the, the first uh, faculty director. And the model we've come uh, to for the Rice Center for Teaching is to have a faculty member direct the center for um, a term of about three years. And then it's a rotating model, so then a different faculty member will come in. And I love this model because I think that it just means that the, the, the teaching center is going to have a lot of uh, life from different facets of the college over, over the years. And so I've been with the Teaching Center for two years now, um, the first two years, and I'll be with the Center for two more years, and then I'm excited to see where different faculty take it um, in, into the future. Um, we also have an associate director, uh, Kate Kirby. Um, she, she's a, a full-time staff member, and she comes from a different teaching center. She was most recently at the Center for Teaching and Learning at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, before that, Vanderbilt University, um, and uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge of the field of pedagogy and teaching and learning. And so, the idea was that Williams faculty would be really good at listening to the interests of faculty and programming for faculty and responding to the needs of faculty. And the associate director is also good at that. Kate is also very good at that. But she also brings a wealth of knowledge about the field of teaching and learning that an individual faculty member might not have, just because I study feeding and sleep more than I've studied uh, the educational literature. But Kate balances that out very, very well. Um, then we have a wonderful administrative assistant, Ann Connolly. Um, and three faculty fellows, um, Zach Wadsworth, from, uh, who's a professor in the music department, uh, Sarah Olson, who's a professor in the classics department, and Joe Cruz, who's a professor in the philosophy department. And if those sound like three very different departments, and then when you include me in biology, that's by design. We really wanted to basically get lots of different faculty opinions from lots of different areas of the college. And um, their role is, is also to listen to the needs of the faculty and inform the programming that we do and, and the kinds of things that faculty would like. And it's been a pleasure to, to work with this team. And it, it's, uh, um, I, I think we do our best to respond to what faculty want to learn about and, and what to hear about. Um, so actually, just last March, we opened our doors. Uh, we have a physical center now. Um, for the first year and a half, we actually didn't have a place, and now we have a place to, to hang our coats and to, to welcome people. It's at the um, extreme side of the building in uh, Stetson Hall, the Stetson part of, uh, uh, of, the, of the library. Um, and it's a very, very uh, beautiful space. Um, I, it, it was renovated from what used to be an audio uh, video room. Uh, the, the audio video room, I think, was really useful. 20, 25 years ago to uh, have video conferencing with uh, people from outside of Williams, but of course now we can all do that on our phones, so that room didn't really serve a, a purpose after that. Um, so we've renovated that room. Um, th there was uh, lots of staff that helped with the reservation, uh, re renovation. Um, Sean Garvey and Laura Wood uh, are, are two staff that did a really great job designing the center and furnishing it. Um, but it's a really beautiful space. I, I have to say, it's, it's very welcoming. There's, there's lots of places for faculty to gather and, and talk. Uh, we have this beautiful library. Um, actually, you know, for me, not being in the education field directly, it's been a thrill to uh, stock the library with all these books about teaching. And um, it, it's, I have to say, sometimes I even enjoy just looking at all the titles. You just see all the titles and to realize all the different facets of teaching and all the different things one could think about. And to, you know, some books I, I've, I've read directly, but some I skim. A lot of times people will, will come by the center and just pick up a book and, and, and you know, look, look through some of the chapters. But it, even just looking at all these titles inspires me sometimes just to see what all the, the different topics are. And actually, I, it kind of also informs speakers to invite. So oftentimes we'll look at these books and, 
um, you know, if somebody really likes a book, then we'll invite that author to come and, and give a talk about the subject of, of the book. Um, but yeah, the center has been beautiful. We have this beautiful conference table. We will host meetings in there, and uh, we host uh, events in there that we, we think will fit the space uh, really well. Um, and so, really, I, I, in my mind, the, the, the teaching center, in terms of the business of the center and what it does, it, it does three things. And so I'll just sort of highlight these, these three things um, one at a time. Is, is one is it basically hosts different events and conversations for faculty to get together and, and talk. And so this is a good example of what one of those conversations might look like. Um, but we, we've had uh, many events over the past two years where faculty can share what they're doing um, and have conversations over a, a specific topic. Um, so for example, this is a, a, a photo from an event we did. We, we, we try to have an event every semester called um, a stumble and a leap, where one or two faculty members talk about something they did in, in, a, in one of their classes that was particularly great or partic particularly unsuccessful. And the idea is that we, we can learn from each other and, and kind of symbol, uh, uh, celebrate our successes and also our, our stumbles and, and learn from each other. And so here is one of the, the first of times we did this, uh, Professor Magnus Bernardson and Janneke Vandestat uh, shared some examples from their own teaching and we had uh, a nice reception and it was just, it, it, it's really great to hear other people's stories and to sort of get out of our own uh, little private niche of Williams College and to hear what other people are doing. Um, we've had lots of different uh, lunches and, and uh, workshops on, on teaching. Um, based on what we've heard faculty want to talk about, sometimes faculty will come to me or one of the other Rice Center staff and say that there's an issue that they would just really love to talk about, big and small. And so we've had a lot of lunches where we'll, we'll get faculty together and we'll just throw out a topic and throw out an idea. So for example, some of the lunches we've had have been about um, the first three minutes of class, like when a class begins. What, what are some of the strategies we do to sort of welcome people and transition them from their busy outside lives into a focused uh, classroom environment. Um, we had a lunch where athletic coaches talked about how they inspire their teams and so uh, academic faculty could learn from that in terms of inspiring people to, to, um, to try their, their best and succeed even in the, the, the face of setbacks. Um, We've had lunches about promoting student wellness and well-being, responding to extension requests, uh, what to do when students are absent, are there a good way to make up for student absences. So all topics, big and, and, and small. And it's been really great to gather with uh, people from, from across the college. And sometimes we try to deliberately make, make up tables so that it's people who wouldn't necessarily run into each other on a daily basis. And so we can all see each other and, uh, and, and have these uh, cross uh, conversations. Um, we've had a successful series of dinners also. Um, so outside of lunches, sometimes we'll, we'll gather um, groups of faculty together in groups of six or eight, and then we'll have a very focused topic, and we'll say, who would like to go to a dinner and meet with faculty they don't normally see to talk about um, a various topic? So for example, uh, the fall semester last year, we, talk, we had dinners on the theme of AI and generative artificial intelligence and how people are adapting to the new emerging roles of artificial intelligence in the classroom. Um, the spring semester, we talked about grades and different modes of grading and how people are um, uh, assessing students in the classroom. And then this semester, we're uh, talking about um, how we teach in the wake of a, an emotional or a traumatic event. Um, so if there's something in the news, obviously we can all think of newsworthy events uh, that have happened in the past year or two that are emotional and traumatic in nature. And so if, if, if something like this happens, how do we teach the next day and, and what are the, the ways that that we support students in, in, the, in uh, the wake of some, something like that. Um, and we're all talking about the upcoming election as well, not to presume any political affiliation or um, uh, you know, any, any students' views, but just the, the election is just sort of a, it's an anxiety producing event that, that's coming up. And no matter who wins or lose, there's a lot of anxiety associated with it. So we're, we're talking a lot about that um, as well. Um, so yeah, we, we've also had a lot of workshops where an expert will come and, and suggest some new ideas. And this is really refreshing to see too, because again, Williams faculty are, are wonderful teachers. Uh, they, they don't need to be taught how to teach, but it's great to hear a new idea from, from an expert. And so we've had visitors uh, come um, from outside of campus, but then we also have asked staff from inside campus to share their expertise. And I think that's one of the great things about the Rice Center also, is that the Rice Center is a great mechanism to help very 
various offices around campus um, amplify their message and to share their message with, with Williams faculty. Um, so we, yeah, we've had you know, various workshops. Here, Kate Kirby, our associate director, is, is leading a workshop with, with faculty. And uh, the turnout has been, I, I, I have to say, that, that to me is one of the um, things that I think is, uh, I'm, I'm the most happy about, is we, we, when we started the teaching center, we talked to a lot of other teaching centers at, at other institutions, and we asked them, what are your uh, frustrations? What are your challenges? What are your, uh, the things that you celebrate? But almost universally, other teaching centers said that they put on events that nobody else comes to. And they, they're very frustrated because they would put on some great workshop or some, some great speaker, and hardly any faculty will come. And the nice thing here, and this is a real tribute to Williams faculty, is that the attendance has been great. Um, I, I think that partly that's because we've tried to find you know, exactly what people want to hear about, but it's partly because I think Williams faculty are so dedicated that they want to go to these, these kinds of events and learn something that maybe they, they, they don't think about uh, uh, regularly. Um, so for example, we had uh, James Lang. Um, he, he wrote a book called uh, Small Teaching, which is all about really um, kind of small things a teacher can do that have a really big effect on a, on a class. So small changes that a teacher can make that have demonstrated um, evidence-based um, uh, results in terms of student learning. Um, he also wrote a book called Distracted about how uh, modern students are distracted and how a teacher can design an individual class session uh, to sort of overcome those di distracted moments. Um, so that is one example. So there are about 80 Williams faculty at the Williams Inn uh, to, to hear his workshop. Um, Wendy Adam, who's the, the director of um, integrative well-being services here at Will Williams College, gave a great um, uh, workshop about uh, student well-being. And um, the focus of this workshop was if, if there's a student who comes into our office and then all of a sudden we realize that the student is um, in emotional duress for whatever reason. Maybe it was because of something that happened in their life or maybe it was because we just handed an exam back or whatever, whatever it is, um, what to do in those moments when we, we need to respond to students and, and show care and, and empathy. Um, but we're not trained counselors ourselves. So um, she led a great workshop on that. Um, and one more example is we, we hosted uh, Joe Feldman, who wrote a really popular book called uh, Grading for Equity, uh, just about different grading practices and, and how to have an equitable grading practice that um, really acknowledges student learning and ass assesses student learning. and um, doesn't uh, assign grades based on other distracting factors um, or th things that might not actually represent student learning. And um, there was a great turnout for this as well. So, so really, I feel privileged because I could really just let all these photographs do the talking. <laughs> you know, this would be a very different um, talk and slideshow if nobody came to anything. But I'm, I'm it, it's so excited to uh, that the conversations have been really strong because Williams faculty want want to go to these events, and so I think that um, really highlights the need for the. The, the teaching center, and I, I think it was really worthwhile that um, that we created it. Um, one of the most successful programs that the Teaching Center now administers, this actually was a program that already existed from the Dean of Faculty's office, but the Teaching Center has now taken it over and we have some of the resources to amplify it a little bit. But it's something called the Teaching Roundtable Program. And in the Teaching Roundtable Program, four faculty um, get together, um, they form a roundtable group, and then each semester, um, they, um, or throughout the semester, they meet for lunch um, four to six times, and then they selectively visit each other's classes. And so these groups of four will go selectively visit one of one person's classes, and then they'll have a lunch and debrief it and talk about it. And it's purely for um, learning from each other. There's, there's no report that's given. You know, it, it's non-evaluative in the sense that this, there's never a report of what people thought about each other's teaching. Um, but the, it's an opportunity for people to see different teaching styles and, and to grow. And so I myself participated in one of these teaching roundtables, and it was just one of the greatest learning experiences I had as a teacher, just to see what other uh, faculty were doing, but then also for faculty to visit my class and give me some reflections. And I have to say, in, in some ways, it, for me personally, this is my own personal opinion of my own teaching roundtable, but it was somewhat reassuring and comforting is that the things I thought were the glaring problems that were in my course, nobody even noticed, which meant that some of it was like more I was worrying about some things more than um, um, perhaps I needed to. But it was great to hear their feedback and to see their styles, and so the teaching round table program is a, is a really popular thing that the, the faculty do. Um, 
So in addition to the programming and the events and the uh, opportunities for faculty, the, the second thing that the Rice Center tries to do is to offer um, course visits and, um, and feedback. And so if there's a faculty member that would like somebody to sit in the back of the class and watch their class outside of a teaching roundtable, we, we provide for those opportunities as well. And so a member of the Rice Center staff uh, will go to the back of the class and try to be a fly on the wall and not interfere with the class um, and sometimes we videotape the class and can uh, show the recording back to the faculty member and have a conversation about what is it that they were trying to do versus our impressions on, and, and what we thought worked really well and uh, maybe some suggestions um, for, for improvement. Um, this has taken different forms and I think newer faculty especially have, have taken advantage of this. That um, uh, Relatively uh, new, new faculty to Williams uh, would like any feedback that they can get. And this is ex uh, um, explicitly non evaluative as well. We never share our thoughts with anybody else um, at the college, so it's, it's completely confidential. In fact, we don't even tell each other um, whose class we're visiting. And so if, uh, you know, Kate Kirby, our associate director, meets and, and observes uh, lots of different classes, and I don't know the classes she's visiting or the faculty that she's, she's talking to, and she doesn't know the faculty that I'm talking to as well. So we don't even share with each other any uh, confidential facts about who, who we're talking about. But, um, but this, this can be a very helpful helpful thing, especially if somebody's hoping to grow in a certain way, and um, it's nice to have somebody sit in on your class and give you some non-evaluative uh, comments based on, on, on what they observe and what they see from their vantage point. And then finally, the, the third thing I'd say that the, the Teaching Center does um, that we work pretty hard at is we've developed a website. And a website, you know, every, everybody could have a website, an institutional website, but what we've tried to do is compile a lot of the things we've learned from all the events we've had and then put those notes in an accessible way on, on our website. So if somebody wants to go to a lunch and they miss the lunch, we take notes at the lunch and then turn it into sort of a bullet point guide or a bullet point list of ideas and put it on the website. So now we've generated a lot of documents that can live on the website and we've uh, referenced other websites as well, other, other teaching resources. So if somebody wants to learn more about active learning strategies or they're curious about a specific uh, piece of technology or they um, uh, are interested in different discussion formats for a class, um, there's links on the website both for things we've created and for things that other people have created that we think are really good to go learn about these different techniques and kind of just explore different different options. Um, so this, we're, we're continually growing this over time as well and I, I think that this is a, also a tremendous resource. So outside of programming and actually talking to other faculty you know, if it's the night before class or the day before class, a faculty member can go and get some new ideas on, on their own by looking at the website and looking at these, these different resources. Um, so, um, I, I, yeah, I'm a huge cheerleader for the center. It, just by virtue of being involved with the center, I have essentially gone to everything. <laughs> and I've seen every lunch, every dinner, um, and I've, I've grown tremendously myself. I, I um, have, every program we've done, there's been some nugget of wisdom that I've taken away that um, I either decide to try or I at least appreciate that other people are doing, um, and um, I've, I've loved it a lot. Um, I would say, um, maybe before uh, taking any other questions, or, or comments. In, in addition to these um, kinds of events and programming that the Teaching Center puts on and, and helping other faculty, um, this is mo more of a global topic, but there, there are three or four um, issues now, not just at Williams, but I think at, at all colleges and universities that faculty are facing um, that are real challenges. And if they had easy solutions, then they wouldn't be challenging, but they, there, there are no easy solutions. And so um, it's a continual topic. And the, the Rice Center has definitely um, tried to address this as much as, as possible through conversations and through, through uh, invited speakers. But just to share with you what these are, um, I think current college students are, are um, really the, the three or four things that, that people are talking a lot about now in higher education is, one is, is student well-being, especially after the pandemic. Uh, the COVID pandemic was obviously a very traumatic event. And right now, Williams is, uh, the current Williams students, most of them were high school students, during the, the, the um, peak of the, the pandemic. And faculty do feel a tangible difference, I think, in, in students who were in high school or in college during the pandemic rather than, than students before the pandemic in terms of what they expect um, from, from courses, in terms of flexibility and um, 
and support, um, and also um, just the challenges that they're facing. I think the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things that happened during the pandemic was we realized all the ways that, um, a lot of ways that college students were struggling that we knew about, but we didn't necessarily know to the degree to which it was exposed during the pandemic when we were all on Zoom and we were learning about each other's lives and, you know, students were Zooming from their bedrooms and, you know, talking about what their home life was like. And I think that exposed a lot of what students go through, but it also exposed the, the need for flexibility. Um, so I think now faculty are much more flexible in the in deadlines and giving exams and um, offering uh, different ways of learning. And I think this is all a, a result. Um, the, the faculty had been talking about this for a long time, but I think the COVID pandemic definitely served as a, a catalyst to accelerate those conversations. And so this is something that faculty are talking about a lot. Um, a second topic that faculty talk about a lot is grading. And um, grading, I think, is, is a hot topic everywhere. Grade inflation is a, um, uh, a phenomenon everywhere I've looked. Um, and there, there's, there's articles in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education and Inside Higher Ed about how different colleges and universities are, are trying to combat grade inflation. But even besides the fact that grades seem to be steadily increasing and the meaning of a grade um, is, is somewhat different than, than what it used to be, um, there's also different ways of grading now that faculty are exploring. Um, there, so uh, unlike you know the classical idea of grading where there's exams and assignments or papers and a faculty member gives a grade and then at the end of the semester there's some percentage breakdown of how that how that all adds up to a final grade there's lots of newer innovative ways that people are talking about grading um, probably the most extreme being something called ungrading where faculty don't want to give grades at all and they basically give feedback and give mentorship um, as if they were working with a with a colleague or a junior colleague instead of a student who who's being assigned a grade and so a lot of these different topics on grading are really interesting um, and uh, my sense, I'll, I'll just speak for myself as a faculty member. I, I myself do not know fully what I think about all of these new styles of grading myself, but it's, it's fun to explore them with other people. And um, there, there have been some really thoughtful things written about these different grading practices that we're trying to invite uh, speakers to, to talk about these subjects and find out um, what are we doing when we're grading students? Um, what, what does an ideal assessment look like? How does the outside world see the grades that we give to students? Um, how does Williams see the grades we give, like how, how, what, what is the impression of what a grade means? And so we're, we're having these conversations and I think that the, the answers to those questions are, are changing over, over the years. And um, so this is a big topic that we're talking about. Um, Another big topic right now is generative artificial intelligence. Um, I don't know if you've all tried uh, ChatGPT or, or one of the uh, Gemini or one of the, the new AI models, but uh, this, this is a big topic on, on uh, college campuses uh, right now, um, including Williams. Um, if you've never tried it, uh, generative AI is, um, I, I think faculty, this is my own way of thinking things, but I think there's four stages of grief about uh, generative AI. Um, the first stage is denial, uh, where uh, when you hear about AI, so AI, if you've never tried it, AI can write essays in seconds. You, you can give AI a prompt and it will generate a whole essay for you in a second. Or if you, add, if you put in an, um, what might be like an exam question, AI can answer an exam question, you know, sometimes brilliantly. And so when, when uh, people first hear about this, I think the first stage of grief is denial, where they say, well, it couldn't possibly respond to my essays as a teacher, or it wouldn't do well on my exam. And so they're in denial, but then they try it, and it sometimes gives a phenomenal essay or a phenomenal answer back. And so that's the second stage is panic, where they sort of realize, oh my gosh, this thing is actually pretty good. Um, and then um, I think a lot of faculty, right when these technologies first emerged a year and a half ago, there were a lot of faculty that were thinking, well, how can we prevent students from, from doing this and engaging in this and ensure that there's no academic misconduct? And we're still having these conversations. And there are some interesting ways faculty have come up with to, uh, to try to sidestep uh, the, the emergence of these platforms. The easiest way is just to assign things in class where there's no computer present and you know to give uh, exams in class or to ask people to write uh, responses to prompts in class. The funny thing about that is if faculty learned anything from the pandemic,
pandemic, it was how to do things remotely. <laughs> because during the pandemic, uh, there was no in-class session. We, ha we had to do things remotely. And I think we learned how to be flexible and let students take exams on their own time whenever they wanted to and do that. And so ChatGPT and, and uh, generative artificial intelligence in a weird way kind of has made us retreat a little bit from that and, and wonder if that's the best idea. Um, but I think actually uh, then what has happened is that the, the, the third stage to me is more acceptance. It's, it's thinking generative AI is not going away and now the mantra among students, it's actually amazing to think William students who are graduating now and every generation will live in a future where uh, careers uh, depend on AI and AI is going to no doubt change the kinds of jobs that exist but it's also going to change the nature of the jobs and what people do do with AI and um, you know I, I remember I was listening to the radio when uh, ChatGPT passed the bar exam uh, so for, for lawyers. And so ChatGPT did very well on the bar exam, and people were wondering, is ChatGPT going to replace lawyers? And the person who was being interviewed about this said, I don't think ChatGPT is going to replace lawyers, but it's going to replace lawyers who don't use ChatGPT with lawyers who do use ChatGPT. And I think that that's what's basically coming for every profession. And in fact, faculty now, including myself, are using ChatGPT. I, I, I use it for various things, and we're exploring how to use it in a productive way that's not doing our job for us, but is that actually is very, a very useful tool, like a spell checker. Um, but there's so many more, because it can do much more than a spell checker, there's all, all, all sorts of uh, issues in, involved with that. And so, um, so I, I think this, this, this sense of acceptance is something that faculty are, are, a lot of faculty are feeling. But then the fourth stage to me is um, empowerment in a weird way, is that I actually think that a lot of faculty now are not just accepting that AI is here to stay, but they're realizing there's so much that one could do with this in terms of a tool. And a lot of students actually have inspired me about this. A lot of my students will come to me and show me the ways that they have used um, artificial intelligence to help, help them learn in a way that I don't think is, is academic misconduct at all. I think it's an amazing learning tool where they can actually have a conversation with AI and learn something that they're struggling with, or they can take a paragraph from one of their papers and ask ChatGPT, is there something that I could do better? And ChatGPT can help them uh, write a little bit better. Um, I can. This, this isn't about teaching so much, but I myself wrote a grant a few months ago, and I took one of my experimental proposals from the grant, and I put it in ChatGPT, and I said, did I forget to say anything in this experiment proposal? Like, is there some detail that's missing, or did I, is there something that I, I left out? And ChatGPT said, yes, you did not specify the concentration of the drug that you plan to do and you didn't say the age of the mice you plan to use. It just found all these things that I realized, oh, that's perfect. That's exactly what I would ask my, my friend to help me with. It's crazy, right? I'm, maybe I'm blowing some of your minds right now <laughs> hearing about this, but... Um, but students are, are figuring this out very, very fast. They, they, um, a lot of students know how to use it really well. And this actually creates an equity problem too because some students are using it a lot um, for, for, for great reasons and then other students have barely used it at all. And so there's kind of an equity thing in that right? because um, you know, that means do I as a faculty member, should I be deliberately showing students in my classes how to use it um, and helping all students to be able to use the tools of AI. Um, but I don't know the best ways of doing that myself because it's so new. And so faculty are really struggling, I think, to learn very quickly um, how to embrace these tools um, and how to help all students uh, learn how to use them and how to specify what things students should use them for and what students uh, shouldn't because people also have different uh, um, uh, decisions about what is academic misconduct and, and what isn't. Um, you know, nobody would think that a spell checker is somehow cheating on, on, a, on a written thing. Spell checkers are ubiquitous, but this is not a spell checker. This is something much more uh, dramatic than a spell checker. And so I think it's up to faculty now to be very transparent about what we expect students to use it for, what we don't think students should use it for, but preparing them for the, the future ahead and uh, the, the, the jobs that they, that, that they will have. Um, so anyway, these, these are big topics and, and the teaching center. We actually just last Tuesday had a speaker talking about AI. Um, her name is uh, Flower Darby and she's written really thoughtful articles in the Chronicle of Heart, Higher Education about AI. And she talked about the three E's of AI, equity, um, ethics, and empowerment. And so um, uh, it, was, it was great to hear her ideas, but there's gonna be so many more ideas coming. And I, I personally think that um, AI is gonna be on everyone's 
phones and watches and, and you know, basically instead of having a tutor or maybe in addition to a, a traditional tutor or office hours visit, every student is going to have their own AI assistant ready and willing to help them and respond to their conversations. And this isn't something that Williams is deciding. It's something that every <laughs> student in, in the, the world will, will have at their disposal. It'll be as ubiquitous as, as cell phones. And so um, Williams faculty are definitely talking with each other about figuring out what to do about this, uh, this new world that we're living in. Um, so anyway, I'll, I, I will end with that. I'll just say it's, it's really just been my, my privilege to be part of the Teaching Center. I'm, I'm a huge uh, cheerleader for the, the Teaching Center. I think it's a great addition to the campus, um, and I would say that um, I feel really lucky to be at an institution where teaching and research is really valued and celebrated, and the Teaching Center, to me, is just one of those big hallmarks of that. I just think that Williams definitely provides the infrastructure for great research, great service, great teaching, but the Rice Center is not just a symbol of that, but it's really just like a, a great new expression of, of valuing teaching and celebrating teaching, and um, it's been a real privilege, and I can't wait to see what my successor in the faculty director role does, and uh, it'll be fun to see this teaching center evolve over the years. So um, so thank you for hearing a little bit about it, and I'd, I'd be very happy to talk about anything related to teaching or the Rice Center or anything in general, but thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Matt. And we do have time for, for q and I do want to give a quick little story about ChatGPT. So Matt doesn't know this, um, <laughs> but when I went to put together his session description, I took the email, the invitation that I sent to Matt, and I put it in ChatGPT and I said, take this email invitation, look at these websites, and come up with a description, because I knew we were going to be talking about AI. And I sent it to Matt. I said, what do you think about this description after doing some you know, human tweaks? And he said, looks great. So that's what's in your program. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to share that story with you. That's amazing. Um, I think it's a, great, it's a great tool, and I think it can help us do our jobs better. It does need you know, human refinement, but I wanted yeah. to share that kind of anecdotally as a that's fun a story. story. Can I add one story on top of that yeah. very quickly? Is that actually <laughs> one, of the, um, one of the big topics of conversation among uh, faculty about AI is can we detect it? And is there a way that you could take an essay and run it through a chat GPT detector and, and indicate whether it, it's, it works or not? And um, th everything that we've found about it is that they're, they're not reliable. The chat GPT detectors that they um, both are, they have false negatives and false positives. Positives, um, but we wanted examples, and the, the director of OIT, um, Baron Koroleski, um, at, did ex something very similar to you. He took my uh, bio that's listed on the biology department website and ran it through an AI detector, and he's determined there's a 93% probability that I am a chatbot. And uh, I wrote the, um, this bio long before ChatGPT started, but I like the idea that there's a 93% chance that uh, I'm actually a, a robot. <laughs> I'm an algorithm, but it works, yeah. Um, sure. Um, is there, uh, sure, right there. Is there? A, I guess there's some mics coming around. I guess there's some mic runners. I think most of us in this audience and anybody who knows about Williams is already impressed with the quality of our faculty. I think it's marvelous that this is a way to kind of internally strengthen multiple parts of that. Question I have is a fair number of students from each Williams class eventually ends up in academia. They mm -hmm. end up as teachers. So how, does, how do your efforts to support faculty mm. translate or integrate with those students who at some level are identifying with or seeking a path of teaching themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. So like, essentially about Williams alumni embarking on academic careers and teaching careers themselves and uh, going off. The, um, actually, the um, Right now, we have three uh, faculty fellows that, that I introduced, Zach, Sarah, and, and Joe. But for the past two years, uh, there was a, a one faculty fellow um, who's uh, Susan Engel, who's a, a professor in the psychology department, but she's an expert on K through 12 education. And she runs a slightly, uh, it, sometimes I worry that the, two, the names of the two centers are, are different, but she runs the program in teaching. We run the center for teaching, and then there's a program for teaching that helps people who are interested in K through 12 education. And then um, a lot of times people develop an interest in teaching and they're not sure if they're gonna do um, you know, secondary education or, or you know, uh, pre-college education, but then sometimes people who go to that go on in academia and then they do college teaching as well. And so um, 
the program in teaching and the Center for Teaching has attracted students. There have been students that want to uh, be involved with both. And actually, uh, one of the things that we're developing right now is we have uh, a student fellows program where students can be involved in the teaching center and learn about teaching. And then um, th they're actually really helpful in, in running uh, focus groups with each other. And we're hoping that once this program is off and running that we'll be able to learn about what students think about various aspects of, of classroom teaching. But the kinds of students who've been attracted to the student fellow position that we run are people who are thinking about uh, academic careers themselves and going on uh, in academia. And actually, one of the, the fun surprises, I didn't predict this, but actually maybe I should have, is that we, I, I've, been, I've received emails from Williams alumni who I never met while they were Williams students, and a lot of them graduated before I arrived. I've been at Williams for 12 years now, um, and they're in, entering academic fields, and then they want to use the Rice Center, and they, they've looked at the Rice Center resources and support as, as they go on. And so it's been fun to talk with them, too, um, in an informal way. Um, um, so I'd say that the, the student fellows that we have, and then just being a, 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 a resource for everybody out in, out in the world. The, the, the Rice Center for Teaching has been publicized a little bit in the Williams Magazine, and hopefully people you know, will get the word out. And um, as the center evolves over, over the years, hopefully more and more alumni will make, make use of it. But yeah, it's fun. <laughs> um, sure, maybe in the middle? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> There's a microphone right there, oh, okay. thanks. Thank you. Uh, I have many questions, but I'll leave it at one. <laughs> sure. I've been very concerned in talking to some students. It's a very small sample. Um, last spring, uh, international students and others. That was the first time, actually, I had come back to anything that had to do with Williams alums. When I was at Williams in 76, we would have, a long time before you, um, <laughs> we would have almost knock down, drag out arguments with one another, outside of class, within class, with professors, outside of professors, but there was a lot of exchange and challenge of ideas. What I have heard from these students is that that is very rare, and in fact, there's a lot of ostracism canceling whatever the correct jargon is if you don't toe a particular line. Right. In, in the teaching that I was exposed to and my classmates were exposed to, I think a lot of us would say that it was those discussions, arguments that would go on for days, <laughs> four years and beyond, 50 years, that we still value. Um, I also thought the teaching was, was very good within the classroom, but even within the classroom, people seem to be stifled. Right. So what kinds of things are teachers doing now? I'm not doubting their right. capabilities, but this is a tough program, and William's education, at least for this small group, is being undercut by not having that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question, it's, it, and you're absolutely right. There's, uh, and I, I had the same experience in college. I remember when I was in college having really great animated debates with people inside and outside the classroom, and even about sensitive topics like the upcoming elections and, and uh, international events and things. And, it does seem different uh, today, and th this is another um, of one of the big issues that I think colleges and universities. I mean, you all know. I mean, I'm sure, like you know, various universities and colleges have really struggled with the issue of the, the balance between um, free speech and a allowing, um, uh, ensuring that students can articulate their views, um, but then also having a, a classroom environment where students feel supported and they don't feel disrespected. And I think that the the boundaries of those two things, um, it. it, it it's been very difficult in, in, in recent years. I think there's actually a lot of reasons for that. I think it's, and, and this exists, this is my impression, is that this is a, a, something that all colleges and universities are, are really struggling with, is the balance between discussing these a big, a big emotionally charged topics um, and being able to do so freely, but also being able to do so respectfully and in an in a environment in which nobody feels feels threatened. And, and I think that there's a lot of factors that have changed things a, a little bit. Um, to some degree, I think even, um, you know, like. Not, even outside of world events and the um, the emergence of the, you know the political situation we have now, where it's not like something that's very different in the political environment. Also, you know, it's just, I, the, the the elections. Uh, 
between Republicans and Democrats that happened when I was in college seemed much less charged than the, the current political environment. Um, I think to some degree too, uh, this is my own opinion, I, I think cell phones have actually changed the, the degree to which students talk about things because partly because of the way they get information and the way that information is kind of just, not only can you read something on a phone that's very politically charged, but then you can just swipe and just keep swiping. So these really uh, assertive statements or assertive points of view just come into a student's mind one after another and um, it's, it's difficult to take the time to process that and to, and to think about it. But I think what faculty are trying to do and what we're learning how to do is to ensure that students can freely express ideas um, and that there's um, all ideas are welcome and welcome to be expressed, but at the same time maintaining a class environment that p uh, students feel uh, welcome and, and included in and supported in. And it's a tricky, it's a very tricky issue. Um, I think we, the right, one thing I can say is the Rice Center has definitely had uh, conversations about this. We've had lunches and, and other workshops about this. And, um, and preparing for the fall election, um, I mean, right now, so the, the theme of our dinners this semester it has been uh, preparing for traumatic events and responding to traumatic events. And we're all expecting that the election is going to be something that, um, you know, in the next couple weeks, people are going to be talking about much more than whatever the outcome of the election is, people are going to be talking about it. And I personally hope that students feel free to express their opinions on what they think uh, of the election and, and what happens, but but also doing so in a way that um, doesn't violate the, the uh, uh, the, the sense of inclusion that uh, we want in our classrooms uh, and outside of our classrooms too. So uh, really the best thing I can say is it's a really trippy, it's a tricky subject that we're all trying to make sense of, which is maybe not a perfect answer to your question, but um, it's, it's one of the things we're trying to talk about. Pick up on Beth's question, uh, great, because that, that was the essence of what I wanted to ask. Is, yeah, sure. You know, first of all, I want to applaud you and just the college for doing this because at the center of a liberal arts education, just when you look at it just purely, is the ability to teach but also convey so that information can be absorbed and then acted upon. But then civil discourse, the ability to actually build a case, debate the case, and have all sides looked at in a civil way has been really challenged. So without wanting Absolutely. to ask best questions again, what I was gonna say is I was really struck, the University of North Carolina has just launched a new school called the School of Civic Life and Leadership which sits inside of their College of Arts and Science, Sciences. Have you looked at taking this on anyway in a curricular or programmatic uh, way, a more structured way rather than a discussion way? Hmm. I see, in terms of like a formal program on yeah, civic I mean, discourse and civic leadership? Or? Right, because even when you go before the elections, you know, you have a controversial speaker come on campus and you know, there's just, I mean, for lack of a better term, it becomes a shitstorm for the, for the college administrators and. You know, can you sure. invite somebody to a graduation? Maybe that's the wrong forum to have a speaker that way. But just the art of being able to listen to somebody else's point of view, learn from it, and then right. decide you disagree with it if that's where you end up, right. is the essence of a liberal arts education. And as Beth did, we're both from the same class, you know, that was one of the benefits we got because I could disagree with somebody, but I go through the learning process, which is the essence. So anyway, North Carolina is attacking it this way, and I didn't know whether you were thinking about doing it curricularly or programmatically as another way to explore the issue. Yeah, I would say more programmatically. I mean, I think um, um, fr from the college's viewpoint as, as a whole, I, I don't know that I could speak to a curricular issue. Um, I, I, I don't believe that there's a, a, a curricular uh, development or, or something that's gonna be sort of a top down or the, the, the establishment of a new institution within Williams to, to address that. But I know faculty are certainly talking about it all the time. And from a programmatic point of view, faculty talk about this a lot. Um, we did, uh, as a faculty, a few years ago, um, adopt a free speech statement. Um, and there was a um, committee that was put together with faculty from throughout the college and students also, student staff and faculty that came up with a, the adoption of a policy for, for uh, discourse and free speech that I think has been widely followed and, and widely uh, celebrated. Um, and uh, certainly I think that all faculty would, I mean I can't speak for all faculty, but it's my experience that all faculty certainly want students to be able to engage in civil discourse and especially listening to opinions that they don't hold 
uh, or listen to speakers who they disagree with in an attempt to learn their point of view and then um, uh, you know come up with really if there's a, an opinion somebody doesn't like they should be able to formulate why they don't like that opinion and be able to respond to it and, and address it I think in recent years one of the problems is that there have been people who right so there you know there's different kinds of speakers and there's different kinds of arguments there there are some people who one would just disagree with because they disagree with their opinion but then there are people who seem deliberately um, their whole drive is not to share their opinion but to foment uh, uh, you know and and uh, really uh, you know kind of uh, stop stop this the sharing of opinions because they're they're using humor and other things to basically uh, make other students and, and other faculty uh, not, it really, it, it's more combative than it is discourse. And I think that the problem is there's so many people who engage in that. And so I think that the, the, the problem is, um, where is the line between listening to a speaker or a classmate you disagree with versus somebody who is articulating an opinion that's not so much an opinion but an attack? Um, um, and how can a student interpret the difference between an opinion that they just disagree with versus an attack or uh, you know um, uh, you know something that they feel threatened by? And so um, it's a it's such a challenging issue. I agree with the premise of the question. I I, I totally agree with what both both of you asked, and um, it's it's just a challenge. I think um, yeah, I mean. Um, um, yeah, the, the speakers who ch students choose to invite and, and faculty choose to invite, I think it's uh, hopefully um, we're t teaching our students in our classes how to engage with them and how to respond in a civil way rather than um, immediately feel threatened by it. And, uh, but it's a tricky issue, yeah. I believe it is. It's, um, I don't know exactly where it is on, on the web, but it, the, the, the statement, it must be. Yeah, I'm sure we could we could look it up and 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 find it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, down in the front. Um, your observation about thank you. Your observation about the the information available on cell phones and the <laughs> trying to drink from a fire hose problem. That's right. Um, have you folks? What have you folks done to think about helping students develop their critical thinking skills? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a whole topic of information literacy, you know, about um, how to acquire information um, and then how to interpret the information that, that is, is acquired and, and learned. And um, the library staff is actually doing a really good job with this, in my opinion. I think that they're really trying to promote where do people get their information from, and then those platforms, what is the source by which they get their information, and how can you be critically evaluative of the information that you get? It's, um, it's kind of like a, I don't, I don't to me, it's like the joke of, of somebody, somebody where, like, where do eggs come from? And somebody says, well, they come from the grocery store. It's like, yes, they come from the grocery store, but you can dig deeper. It's like they come from a farm, right? But then you could be like, well, how, where on the farm do they come from? How, what is the process by which is it generated? And I, I think of that as information now. It's just like, okay, I got some information. Where did the information come from? It came from Twitter. It's like okay, but where did twi you know where did that come from? It's like somebody citing a study. Where did the study come from? In fact, what what are the algorithms that make some studies come up above other studies? You know, like how is the information that one is acquiring? What is the order of the information that that it's received? So I, I think the library staff is actually doing a great job with this in, in information literacy. And of course, in our classes, we try to. I think in our own fields, we we disseminate this as well. It's I, I in the neuroscience program here right now. My students are are writing. A a, um, a review article where they're trying to synthesize a lot of research studies and we've talked about um, where are you getting these studies from and what is the best way to look up the studies and, and things like that too but it's a big problem with phones now though too and I think again back to chat GPT I think chat GPT, a lot of a lot of people in the future are going to be using chat GPT to ask a question chat GPT will respond with an authoritative answer and we need to make sure our students know where is it getting this answer from what what are ways you can confirm the answer and all, all sorts of things like that. That's a great question. Yeah. Uh, maybe right there. I think there's a mic coming right there. Thanks. Um, I see diversity as a, a good thing. Uh, its most obvious element here at the college is coeducation, which began mm -hmm. after my class graduated. It <laughs> oh, was wow. announced at my graduation, oh, wow. in fact. Uh, but uh, it has certainly continued since then and could be 
labeled with any number of uh, descriptions at this point. Uh, it's certainly uh, a part of this discussion of uh, class dynamics and uh, the issues that faculty face. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, about inclusion? Of uh, uh, diversity as it relates to uh, faculty issues and student issues both. Sure, yeah. yeah. No, it's such an important issue and, and Williams is obviously very dedicated to, to those issues as well. I mean, I think everybody, um, in terms of the classroom, but obviously outside of the classroom too, we all are committed to making Williams a welcoming place where everybody feels like they belong, um, where everybody can thrive, and where we try to address things that all students can benefit from, um, and all faculty and staff too, obviously. I think of um, uh, when preparing classes and when preparing a curriculum, uh, a renewed uh, dedication to it, making sure that what it is that I'm planning to teach and the way I run my classroom is accessible to everybody and welcoming to everybody so that all students feel like they belong there. Um, actually, this was something that this was a big learning uh, experience for me is just realizing uh, after about a year of being at Williams that all Williams students felt differently about my classroom, um, about like what, um, uh, that some students felt like they deserved to be at Williams a little bit more than others, or, or so, some students felt like they just somehow got in, or they, they didn't really deserve to be there. And so there, there's lots of strategies um, that um, and philosophies that the uh, OIDEI, the um, Office of in, in Institutional Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Rice Center for Teaching, also the Office of Accommodations. Um, you know, lots of offices are basically um, coming up with lots of great resources and strategies to make sure that all students feel Feel welcome that we can address lots of different learning styles um, and uh, even something there, there's so many simple things that one can do in a classroom too which is I mean, for, for example I'll just throw out a few ideas is now I, this is something I've learned from other faculty um, but now on the first day of class I always hand out note cards and I ask students to tell me a few things about themselves and ask for a little biography and then you, some, somewhere along that first week I'll try to write the students an email and just say hey I noticed you said this and I'm looking forward to meeting you and just a way to establish a personal communication, even if I don't have time to say hi to all 72 students individually at once, um, or to ensure that when I have a, a slideshow, um, that um, if, if, if I'm teaching physiology and I'm showing pictures of people in my physiology slides, that I, I'm making sure to include uh, photographs of people from all walks of life, all ages, a, a, a diverse group of people, so students won't think that I'm biased myself towards only focusing on a single kind of group of people. And so I think there's a lot of um, uh, ways that faculty and, and staff go about this as, as well. But um, certainly, yeah, we really hope that uh, everybody feels included and um, that they, uh, the sense of belonging is really what I, I try to get, get to, yeah. Right. Right. Well, there, and there's so many forms of diversity too. I mean, I, I think that the, um, I'll just share with you, during, during the um, COVID-19 pandemic, when um, in, the, in the spring, when that really hit in, in March of 2020, and students were, were um, asked to go home, and uh, like all college students were, and so faculty were now teaching their classes over, over Zoom. And that was such an eye-opening experience to so many people because there were some students who uh, got together with some of their friends and rented a beach house and that they were, you know, like in a, in a very privileged environment. And then there were some students who were zooming into class, but they obviously were sharing a room with two of their siblings and it was a very different environment. And the, the differences in socioeconomic background and, and home culture and, and all sorts of things just become front and center in a way that was really interesting. And so I think that, the, yeah, the best thing that we can do for to um, embrace different viewpoints and, and d different um, accessibility options and making sure students all feel welcome is, is really just to um, appreciate as faculty just the diversity of where everyone is coming from and to make sure everybody feels like they belong and that their opinion matters, that, you know, that they, they should all feel free to share their opinion and, and feel, share their life experience and their viewpoints. And um, yeah, that's, I think all faculty strive for that. It's a, it's a good point. Back there, oh, great, Neil. <laughs> Matt, this is a little bit off topic, but your expertise is the brain. 
<laughs> and most of us in the room are getting older. Yes. <laughs> Do you have any insights that we should be aware of of what's going to happen to our brain as we continue to age? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And Neil was a, uh, I, I taught a, uh, an online class. Neil was one of my students over the summer <laughs> for an online class, so it's, it's nice to meet you in person. Um, yeah, the brain is, uh, the, the one thing I, I would say above all else is, is practice uh, and, and uh, um, constant exercise of the brain. It turns out that the brain is actually, uh, even though it's completely different, uh, um, a very different organ than a muscle. It's just like a muscle in the fact if, if you stop using it and uh, you don't keep up practice, then um, that, that's when you start to lose some of the um, acuities and, and uh, abilities to do things. So just like somebody who isn't getting regular exercise, if you're not using your brain uh, regularly, and obviously we all use our brains every day, but, I, but I'm saying in terms of keeping it sharp and, and uh, um, uh, thinking about things, uh, you know, solving problems, do, doing tasks, um, the, the best thing for the brain is exercise, just, just like uh, uh, muscle exercise and, and physical exercise. And so I guess that's the, that's the big global thing that I would say. So, and a really a great way to do this is kind of just like how you did it where I met you is to like, you know, keep uh, challenging yourself intellectually, uh, you know, keep um, exploring the, you know, go to a museum around you and, and things too. I, I try to do that. I, 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 I hope that everybody doesn't stop doing that at a certain point of their life. But it, it's been demonstrated. I, I've read studies that basically basically show that people who are, are, are consistently challenging themselves to go to a new museum or to experience a new, um, even a new TV show that is challenging in some way, um, that it's really stimulating and it keeps the brain going just like exercise does for, for the body. So that's what I would say as a neuroscientist. <laughs> but I don't, I'm not selling anything. So. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Why don't we go in the, in the middle and then we'll go, go to the side. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, it, it, is it easier to give the mic over there? Why don't we do that first and then I'll, I'll make sure we get to you. <laughs> I, I've Thanks. got the mic. Uh, sort of a, a different, it occurs to me that your Rice Center job is a full-time commitment. How do you balance that with keeping focus on your students and teaching? Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great question. I appreciate that a lot. So yeah, in terms of the way that the Rice Center is currently structured is that um, the faculty director, um, it, it is a very uh, time intensive job. Um, there was a thought that whoever the faculty director was, it would be great if they would still be in the classroom to some extent so that if there's an issue like generative AI or, or one of these, these issues that comes about, that the faculty director would be directly experiencing you know, everything along with the rest to the faculty and so the model that's been developed is that there's a, a, a course reduction so basically I'm not teaching as much as the average Williams faculty member is right now too but I'm still teaching a little bit so right now I'm teaching a, uh, a single seminar course to neuroscience seniors and um, if, if I wasn't associated with the Rice Center I would be teaching more than that and so um, because of the course reduction it does free up some time um, but uh, to the spirit of your question, I could always use more time. I would, <laughs> but I, I, I have to say though, I really do value being in the classroom, not just because I like it, and I obviously I, I really like teaching, but um, it has been helpful. I, I think that um, you know when the Rice Center started two years ago, I think AI is a perfect example. It's like AI hadn't really come on the scene until the end of uh, 2022. Is that right? 2022. Yeah, and so. Um, I, I value the fact that I have students who come to me and show me how they're using AI, and those aren't students I would regularly interact with if I wasn't doing any teaching at all. Um, but that the associate director that we have, Kate Kirby, um, works full time, and she um, is sort of the, you know, the she holds down the fort, uh, you know, uh, 40 hours a week in terms of the the Rice Center itself, and so that's that's the model we came up with. But in a sense, the Rice Center is kind of a fun experiment in and of itself. You know, it's it's like we created this teaching center, and we're you know constantly uh, you know reevaluating things and wondering where to go. So um, maybe in the future it'll change. But for right now, I, my personal assessment is right now we've we've got the right model. Model. But I'm, I'm very happy to have the course reduction, though. <laughs> it's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the middle. Yeah. <laughs> 
And this gentleman sitting behind me who obviously took a course of yours online because one of the things that occurs to me is the lifelong learning, which was really something I, I think all of us in this room yeah. uh, took away from Williams College and value. I, I'm just wondering whether, um, because the, the national climate, there's been a lot in higher education, assault on liberal arts education. That's right. And uh, a tendency to think it must be you know, directed more toward you know, a career, professional jobs, et cetera. I'm wondering if that's something the faculty has talked about at all in the context of your Center for Teaching. Yeah, like the, the value of a liberal arts education yes. Yes. specifically. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely something, you know, I, I feel like it's definitely something that everybody celebrates about Williams, you know? I mean, I think that like Williams isn't gonna change in, in that respect. This is my opinion, obviously, but I, I cannot imagine Williams ever changing from that fact. Like Williams just celebrates the liberal arts constantly. And obviously from photos like this, I mean, I, I just love the fact that we're looking at a history professor sitting next to a Russian professor and the audience is made up of biology and chemistry and theater professors. And it's just that like, everybody celebrates this. And the Rice Center, I think, just amplifies it, you know? It just it creates so many more opportunities for this, and it integrates staff and, and the various offices uh, on, on campus um, that um, also have something to say. And so I know it's a, it's a feature. I've noticed the rhetoric too. Um, again, this is just me as a person, you know, thinking of um, a current events. But I noticed that you know the the platforms of the two parties, the Democrats and Republican Party, has changed a little bit. Like even the, some of the rhetoric from the Democrats, which which used to be a college education for everyone, and now the, the you know some of the tone of that has even changed where it's like, oh, you don't have to go to college, you can do, which is good, and I mean, they're very valid arguments, but Williams isn't gonna change, I don't think. You know, Williams celebrates the liberal arts, I think it celebrates, this is a place where, where people experience lots of different forms of learning to help them uh, later in life, and, and uh, nobody sees our field as the, the, you know, I don't interpret biology majors as people who are just gonna go off and be academics or doctors, I, I think we embrace that as well, and that's not gonna go away at all. I think. Yeah, these pictures say more than I'm probably articulating myself on that front. So Williams isn't going to change in that in that respect. So no no worries about that. <laughs> one more. There's one. <laughs> um, just looking at the faculty um, interacting with each other and modeling lifelong learners and and the discourse of different views and and accepting each other's points of view. How much are the students aware of you modeling <laughs> the ideal of Williams being this model community of all these different people from all these different walks of life? I mean, yeah. That's our goal for the world, really. Right, yeah. That's a great question, too. The, the student... <laughs> It's funny, yeah, because the, the 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 center for teaching is a faculty facing and to some extent a staff face facing institution, um, and w I did not know while we were creating the center and now that the center is off and running what the student reaction would be or what students would think and i was surprised when students started contacting us and actually in response to a previous question about um, student involvement or, or students who want to go on and, and be teachers themselves some of the students who've contacted us are are people who are thinking about teaching themselves but a lot of them just want to get involved and they they are very interested in shaping teaching not because they think we're doing something wrong it's not an effort to say like oh how can i convince my professor to do something differently but more they're they're also invested in their education and they, they have a lot of ideas and things they want to share um, there was actually a very thoughtful article written in the record um, a week ago in the student newspaper about grades and grade inflation I thought it was so well put and I, I contacted the student and I just thought I thought it was really great and I would love their involvement and and everything and I think the student fellows program we're creating um, um, is great for that I don't know the if students um, you know I love sharing these photographs and if you go to the Rice Center website, the very first thing you see on the homepage is a lot of these photographs. We just try to put them up to show, you know, a lot of the excitement. But, you know, there's no students in these pictures. They don't necessarily see it themselves. But hopefully it will filter down. Um, but I think that Williams faculty, to be honest, have already done, are already doing a great job of that in terms of, 
I don't know, but the, based on the students in my classes, I'll go to various functions on campus depending on who's in my class and who's in my lab. And so if, the, if I have softball players in my class, I'll try to go to the softball game. Or if there's a theater performance and there's somebody in the, in the performance in my class, I'll go to the theater. And then it's great because it, I'm not the only one. I'll go there and I'll see other faculty there and we're all there together even though we're all through different walks of the college. And so I think that this, this idea of faculty from all walks coming together to be part of the college is something that already exists really well and um, and obviously the students bring that uh, uh, sense of connectivity is as well like their friends a biology major is not only friends with biology majors you know they're friends from all walks of campus and so I've gotten to know students just because they're friends of the students that I have in my classes and stuff but I I think that interconnectedness has not gone away um, at all and actually as the campus expands I mean my sense is I don't know what it's like to be in your shoes but you know I know what it's like to go back to a college campus and you see all the new buildings and you see how the campus is changing and my sense is the Williams campus has kind of expanded and broadened a little bit but that sense of connectivity I don't think has changed at all it's just like I still see the same you know, diverse group of faculty at a softball game or a theater performance or a music performance. And so um, the Rice Center, if anything, it amplifies it among faculty um, and uh, hopefully students will, will know. I love it when a student asks me if I know a, a professor in my own department. I love it when they say like, oh, do you know Professor Banta? It's like, yes, um, she works three doors down from me. Of course I know who she is, you know, but they, they really love seeing us all together. And um, um, yeah, I, I think they're exposed to that in other ways too, yeah. It's a good question. Um, I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you so much for attending this and um, enjoy the weekend. <laughs> great.